Uh, good morning. Uh, the demo gods are not smiling fondly on me right now. I'm trying to uh, actually show a demonstration on uh, uh, one of our latest proof of concept uh, prototype systems. And I can either show you the slides or show that, so I guess I'm going to have to show the slides. Fortunately, I do have some screenshots from the demo, so I can at least talk to them. Uh, and then you can come touch the pretty shinies if you, if you really want to afterwards. Um, I'm here uh, from GE Global Research uh, with my co-conspirators, Bill Smith and Monty Wiseman. I think everybody's been, been uh, talking to us, so I think they're pretty well introduced. Now, a little explanation on the title. Um, when doing the application, uh, putting our proposals in, there was a tiny, tiny you know, space allowed for the abstract, and I just couldn't fit everything in. And like any good hacker, I said, hmm, I wonder how, how I can get around this length limitation. I noticed that the title was not length limited. So, <laughs> so if you want to limit the, the total thing, you need to limit not only the abstract, but also the title. Um, talking a little bit about what we're doing, uh, GE, um, large industrial company in lots of different areas. Um, and one thing that's common across all of them is embedded control systems and a really deep need for security. So whether it's financial industry, uh, transportation, medical, uh, lighting, um, uh, power generation, uh, uh, oil and gas, uh, jet engines, these are all big machines doing you know, big uh, dangerous things and they need control systems that are both robust and secure. Um, just to zero in on one of these uh, industries, just power generation, GE has half of the world's installed power generation base. It's from GE. 10,000 gas and steam turbine generating units, over a million megawatts of installed capacity in 120 countries, 40% share of the worldwide market for new power generation equipment, uh, largest supplier of transmission and distribution equipment in the United States, top three worldwide. Uh, this comes, I think, under anybody's definition of critical infrastructure. And of course, we know, not preaching to the choir here, just kind of explaining what we understand what the issue is. Um, critical infrastructure is under attack. We're definitely in the era of nation-state nation attacks in the wild actually have happened. Uh, Admiral Michael Rogers, head of the NSA, said this is the number one thing that keeps him asleep at night is attacks, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we all know about Stuxnet. Uh, Stuxnet is an interesting from the threat model perspective for us because we want to defend against nation state attack and guess what? Stuxnet demonstrated that even air gap systems can be compromised. In fact, in that particular instance, and I'll come back to this theme later, um, the only thing that the air gap did was keep uh, the victims from knowing that they'd been hacked. And uh, so we really need to change our strategy there. Ukraine was also a very interesting attack. Again, this was on power distribution, nation state attack. Um, and one of the most interesting aspects was that they went after the control systems and they did everything they could to actually brick them. So not just wiping hard disks, which could be easily reloaded, but actually zeroing out firmware in the embedded systems such that they would not even boot and could not be reloaded locally. And these were returned to the factory style um, uh, or recovery necessary. So we need to look not only at, at you know, integrity of systems, we also need to look at, at you know, denial of service bricking style attacks um, because those have been actually seen in the wild. A little bit about industrial internet. In the past, the tradition has always been to uh, keep the industrial device, such as a, a turbine generator, uh, on its own network with real-time uh, operation uh, between the controller and the sensors and actuators. And this was an isolated network. And um, there was a local network uh, talking to HMIs. These are the user or management interfaces that control the controllers that control the device. Um, and then there would not be any external connection. Um, what's happening now, though, is 
our customers are, are um, interested in having data, operational data coming from the devices, in this case generators, to come up into a central location, into a cloud type style, because uh, there are lots of things you can do if you actually collect the data continuously. You can do analytics, um, you can display, deploy, uh, manage the systems, but most importantly, they have this thing called MBOC, uh, model-based optimizing control. And with model-based controls, if you're actually continuously monitoring the devices, you can actually do a much better job of optimizing. And they're seeing returns, you know, with these centralized um, per, per device monitoring, they're seeing optimizations in the five to 10% range where 1% is millions of dollars. So we're, the, the customers are, are deeply interested in, in this optimization to save lots and lots of money. And so if we even went to them and said, well, you, you know, you need to air gap your system, you know, and one said, well, okay, we'll be more secure. On the other hand, we'll lose hundreds of millions of dollars. You can guess who wins that argument. Um, so we really need to be able to look at how to uh, connect our systems in a safe way uh, and defend against these, these nation state attacks that can uh, get through air gaps, can get through, uh, can actually brick devices while still being able to central, centrally collect all our information. So our basic, one of our basic concepts here is security is throughout the stack. It starts from the very hardware device, the firmware, operating systems, um, uh, all the way up through the cloud at, at all the different levels. Uh, but the overriding thing is, as much as we can, we want to have defense in depth, prevent them from getting in with all the different types of mechanisms, but also recognizing that if a nation state's coming after our controller, they will get in. And at least what we want to do is to be monitoring them continuously in real time and uh, make sure that we at least detect when they have compromised our systems. Um, this actually, information assurance framework from the NSA, there are lots of different things. There are the original orange book and common criteria and all the rest saying how much you need. Well, we're in the exceptionally grave damage to security, safety, financial posture of infrastructure and extremely sophisticated adversary with abundant resources will take extreme risk, e.g. nation state. So, you know, we're really firmly down in, in, in this area here. Traditionally, if you go Orange Book, that's A1 or common criteria, that's uh, EAL7. Um, and it, it's the sort of thing where we really need to be, be doing everything as defense in depth and monitoring all the way up through, through the stack. Specifically, what we've been doing in, in terms of reference implementations that help our product groups, you know, create the next, you know, generation control systems. Um, is providing architecture, design, reference implementation uh, for them. So we actually have reference implementation running on here that looks at all the different levels. So if you start at the platform level, selection of processors with, with specific security features. So can your processor actually do DRTM? Does it have an IOMMU? Does it have virtualization? Um, Next level up on security hardware, so this is board level, does it have a TPM? Does it have a TPM 1.2? Does it have a TPM 2.0? Um, do we have other, other hardware devices essential for roots of trust? Do we have the various different boots? I'll, I actually have a slide on these, but protected boot is, is a concept that it can't be bricked remotely, which is very important. Verified, measured boot, uh, firmware. And so for example, UFI secure boot or trusted grub true, T-boot for DRTM. Uh, encrypted disk, integrity measurement and appraisal, hardware protected keys. So in the trusted operating system level, we're looking at encryption, for example, locks, key management with TPM locks, so that we actually, in fact, the only way of decrypting the, the file system is to boot the correct operating system uh, with correct measurements. Only then is the key to the root file system unlocked um, and the only place that key is kept is, is in the TPM. Um, integrity measurement architecture and, and also with a client and, and the corresponding attestation server in, in the infrastructure. Uh, things like trusted keys where again, we don't expose keys to user space. They're in the kernel, they're only in the kernel. They're monitor, their private keys are kept only in the TPM, never leave the TPM unencrypted. 
uh, and even the, the uh, uh, any symmetric keys stay in the kernel and are not exposed to user space. So comprehensive you know, set of things that we're doing with Linux in the kernel. Uh, data and motion encryption uh, based on hardware protected keys. Again, you know, we use the TPM not only for internal key management also, but, but also for the application and network level uh, key management. Security services, directory services, attestation server, public key infrastructure, security management. Uh, in, in this kind of environment, one of the security services that's most interesting or most challenging is if we're going to be signing all of our files for verification at all the different levels, um, how do we have a, a signing service uh, that meets our needs? And you know, in, the, in cases like this, like with generators, they're typically out in the field 30, 35 years. How do we actually have a certificate authority and, and signing server that can even you know, generate certificates and, and, and that, that last um, for that long? It's a real challenge. Uh, current systems will typically say, well, maybe five years. You know, no, no, we need 35 years. And part of that, you have to recognize that you may be going through multiple generations of hardware uh, key storage devices, HSMs, uh, and you have to be able to move you know, or migrate keys from one generation to the next to be able to meet the requirements. Uh, secure development lifecycle, certification, penetration testing, uh, again, to verify that, that when you've assembled all these things that you, know, it's, it's the, you don't have the composition errors or the, uh, um, the whole is greater than some of the parts is a normal statement, uh, but in security, it's the sum of the parts is often a whole. And uh, so you need to make sure that we've assembled these you know, correctly. So it's not any single technology. It's defense all the way down and, and, and detection all the way back up the stack. Um, specific types of secure boot. I know the nomenclature, everybody calls things differently. I mean, originally there was secure boot that Bill Arabaugh start, you know, said way back when. Um, and there have been appraisal and there's verified and uh, secure boot measure. Anyway, so what we've been trying to standardize is on a set of things. Protected boot is all about saying that the remote attacker cannot erase the flash and essentially brick the device. Um, that's a necessary requirement for anything on top of that. Uh, so on top of that, you can have verified boot uh, or UEFI secure boot or locked bootloaders or you know, um, different types of appraisal. Measured boot, um, static root of trust or dynamic root of trust. And uh, even better are combinations of these. So we think it's important not only with a traditional trusted computing model where you collect hashes, we also want as much as possible to do a, a verification of signatures and attestation of those signatures um, taking advantage of the TPM. So TPM is not just, you know, its measurement and attestation environment, it is also the perfect environment for conveying or attesting to signatures on your files, which makes uh, appraisal much, much easier. Um, another one of the challenges that is, uh, with our control, embedded control systems uh, is we cover a lot of different architectures and a lot of different requirements. So obviously Intel and AMD, these traditional controllers are are basically um, ruggedized PCs. Um, they're typically sealed and fanless and able to withstand you know, uh, rough operating temperatures, but you know, largely a, a PC type of uh, architecture. Um, and so we do have available UEFI, you know, protected boot, uh, trusted boots, I'm sorry, ver uh, measured boot and, and, and uh, verified boot. But there are other architectures, ARM, and some ARM plus FPGA, so you're looking at TI, Freescale, Xilinx type platforms that are very uh, useful in, in the embedded environment. Um, and those you know, work with different environments. So they're typically Yocto type uh, environments, uh, booting with U-Boot. U-Boot uh, does have verified boot thanks to Google, but um, there are still some, some uh, issues and gaps there. Uh, CPU slash ROM based secure boot. So a lot of these processor sets that are you know, aimed at embedded uh, have some sort of hardware um, secure boot where it's either 
a key is actually in, in e-fused into it or sometimes actually metal mathed ROMed into the chipset. Um, and so those are, you know, what you might actually come, you know, sometimes called locked bootloaders. Um, so we have a lot of that in, in addition to, you know, traditional um, uh, uh, boot style or U-boot style uh, protection. Um, they also tend to have other types of TPMs, SPI and I squared C, rather than the typical uh, uh, LPC bus types of trusted platform modules. Uh, PowerPC, aviation actually does a lot of, of its work on PowerPC. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, when they do software, uh, the FAA validation is ex extremely expensive. It can cost you know, $150, $200 million to get an FAA certification. And they really don't want to move that onto a new architecture because then, again, it would be very, very expensive to recertify. So we do have some legacy systems that need to run PowerPC. So we need solutions there. So we need you know, the same thing, U-boot, um, some sort of uh, verified boot, and, and uh, typically SPI TPMs. We also need to do this for virtualized environments. So as part of the architecture, we are looking uh, on the mid-level mid systems at doing uh, both the virtual machines and containers. Um, and we need some way to to have support for uh, measured and or verified boot um, and attestation for the virtualized environments. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the issues there. Um, so I have a couple slides here, and, and I've been updating them as, as this meeting has gone on because uh, the summit has gone on because a lot of these are, are already being addressed or, or at least discussed. Our biggest uh, issue right now is TPM 2.0 support. Uh, these are you know, hard and fast requirements by, for, by a lot of the standards bodies. Our controllers have to, have to uh, get away from, from, uh, from SHA-1 uh, to get certification. Um, fortunately, we had a wonderful uh, BOF last night with all the key people in it. So a lot of our issues have, have at least are in planning stage, and at least there's some consensus and that was you know, already you know, reviewed by Yarkov. And, and uh, um, so some of the issues, resource management, he talked about that. Uh, another issue, getting the boot log or the event log, the boot time event log uh, to the kernel. Um, and for PC architectures, that was done with ACPI before. Um, now they're looking at perhaps doing that through UFI table. Uh, and other architectures, doing it through the device tree is probably a way, but um, you know, this is something that does have to be addressed, and, and agreeing on APIs. Um, I, I, anyway, the BOF has gone a long ways towards answering a lot of those questions, or at least getting the work started. Measured and verified boot on UEFI platforms, uh, particularly with TPM2, and, and, and Matthew discussed a lot of those issues there. And, uh, you know, I think there's at least an outline of, of how to proceed uh, forward with that. Uh, container file systems, um, James talked a little bit about this. I, I would um, um, uh, talk a little bit more about some of the other container issues though. And, and in particular, when we're doing a, a strong measurement and attestation or verification slash measurement slash attestation environment, um, we need some sort of solution that makes attestation reasonably tractable. And if we're having containers come and go, if we're having VMs come and go uh, on a, on a mid-level system, how do, we, how do we keep track and how do we verify a measurement list? And currently what happens is all of the measurements for all of the uh, containers go into uh, the native measurement list and all of the measurements inside a VM would go into the guest's kernel's measurement list, assuming we have a virtualized TPM to support it. Um, and, and that's fine for VMs, but for the containers, you know, we need something that's, that's more tractable. What we really want to do um, is to be able to say, this is the measurement list for container one, this is the list and attestation for container two, and, and so on, and, and not necessarily you know, have a collection of all possible measurements from all possible containers that have come and gone over the lifetime of, of the boot, because that you know, would rapidly become untractable. 
Uh, on the other hand, we do need to make sure that if we were running a tainer, that it's not an excuse not to measure or not to uh, verify files in there. So we have to have, you know, essentially a hierarchical policy of some type. So it looks like maybe one solution to that is what people are discussing, which is namespacing IMA. Um, and I know of one project, Yushang Sun, uh, uh, has been working on a patch set for that, which is in, in a kind of early level, not quite ready to go. Um, upstream, not even RFC level quite yet. But this patch set at least allowed for each container to have its own policy hierarchically, um, its own measurement list, its own VTPM. And being hierarchical, um, it's, it's easy to, to separately attest and to separately uh, verify. Uh, but this is just one thing. I don't know if there are other people working in that space. So um, if, if there are, you know, let's try to, to get together and, and uh, coordinate through Mimi, I guess, <laughs> as to um, an approach for that. Um, I think the question that kind of came up just recently you know, with, with the talks this morning is, is there, in fact, a generic concept of a namespacing uh, security modules in general. Um, in other words, if you want to have the same sort of hierarchical policy, same sort of hierarchical uh, reporting, auditing, uh, is it something that we want a gen generic mechanism, not a separate one for each of the different uh, uh, modules? So um, I think that's an open question. But we certainly can start with Yushong's um, uh, patch set and, and see how that goes. A hypervisor support for VTPM. Um, I mentioned this under virtualization. There are patches out there. We are using those patches currently. Um, uh, certainly, it would be nice to get those upstreamed in some sense. So. <laughs> so right, what we're using right now is, is Stefan Berger's patch set, yeah, which is the IBM software TPM, or lib TPMS, um, with actually Mike Q's driver <laughs> and, uh, and Stefan's um, um, patches to QMU to handle the appropriate IO controls um, to talk between QMU and, and the software TPM. Uh, for things like uh, reset and, and, and so forth that are actually have to be emulated hardware type things. Um, doing something you know more embedded in the kernel I would be interesting. Um, I'm not quite sure you know if we want which approach we want to take, but this is one that we actually have running now, so at least it's it's something that works. And from the uh, either you know potentially the Container perspective or the or the uh, virtual machine perspective, at least you can say it's outside the guest. The guest cannot directly, you know, attack the software. So you at least have that level of protection. So are you using it for um, boot up and through the container? Are you using it for crypto capabilities to key, key storage? Yes, at at. at uh, well, certainly for the VMs. I mean, we haven't really looked at that. I mean, we you could use it for key management, I guess, in, in, in the containers also. Um, it's a little bit different, but certainly in the VMs, yes. And, and we've actually, you know, prototyped some of that. Um, so, yeah, the, this, the, the summit has been wonderful because we've gotten at least to talk to all, all the critical people face to face, and we've seen a lot of the progress that's going on here. But the, that's our, our, I guess, our number one set of lists. Some minor ones um, SPI TPM driver um, and, and Peter, and uh, uh, that's actually out in 4.8 RC now, which is great. Um, corresponding question, though, is how do we get that backported into U-Boot? I don't know if we have any volunteers for, for that, any experts on putting TPM drivers into U-Boot, but we're certainly going to need it there. Uh, Lux and Systemd support for kernel keyring. So currently what we're doing with Lux and TPM Lux, I don't know if you're familiar with TPM Lux, but Lux by default can accept keys only from, from a console or from a file. and there traditionally has been support for that um, in um, uh, 
the boot scripts and recently in system D, which has taken that over. Um, but uh, in our case, it's kind of ugly in the initram FS to have a, a utility read the key out of the TPM and then turn around and put it in a file, and hopefully in tempfs, and then point the scripts to that file to, to unlock the root file system. It'd be much more elegant if Lux could actually just directly pull a, a key off the kernel keyring, um, and we could point to that with a kernel command line option or something to say which key to use or something like that. But that also would require not only kernel support for in Lux to, to this alternate keying, but also require modification in systemd because systemd is now hard coded, it's not a script, um, and it would have to also understand that, uh, that method of keying. But that would be much better because then the key would never get into user space. We're not doing this kludge of writing it to a file temporarily and, and then uh, putting it back in, which is kind of kludgy. Um, or another thing is, you know, maybe ext4 encryption is another option because it already does understand kernel key rings. And uh, <laughs> so that's another one we need to start looking at as, as an option. But currently we're using uh, TPM Lux. CPUs without public documentation on their processor verified boot. This is, to me, a really scary one. Um, most processors actually have some sort of processor, most SOCs at least, have some sort of processor-based secure boot, hardware-based secure boot, and I've not found any of them that are publicly documented. We see them all under NDA, and if the OEMs don't properly configure them, they're gaping denial of service holes, because, you know, if the OEM hasn't properly said either, you know, we support this or we turned it off, and if it's left in, in, in this uh, uninitialized state, then an attacker could come in, set some random key, um, and your system will never boot again. And, and that would be really bad because that actually bricks the CPU, the actual processor, the actual SOC. So I'm really concerned that, you know, particularly given the bricking attacks in, in the Ukraine, that there's a whole area out here that we, we don't have any real visibility into unless we're under NDA. Um, and a lot of these chipsets you would never think actually have that type of secure boot. So um, the other one, CPUs with binary blobs. And so, yeah, we had the presentation from AMD that there's yet another security processor in there with another opaque blob, uh, blob. but the traditional ones, SMI, ME, Trust Zone, um, that, that uh, it, oh, this is, this is good for you, this is good security if you would trust us. And I go, um, okay, maybe. Um, package signing tools uh, and integration of those with, with signing servers. Um, there's some issues that we, we need to do there. I know that, that uh, Mimi's been kind of pushing that along and working with distros. Uh, it's a little bit easier for us because in the embedded space, we control the box, we control everything's on it, we sign it all, so we don't have to deal with third-party keys or any of the other kind of nasty things or users arbitrarily loading new stuff in. So it's a little bit easier for us. Uh, yeah, as I say, key management for third-party signed files is just not really so critical in embedded space. Uh, those are the gaps that I had. Um, that we're working on. There's one gap that we've actually filled ourselves and we're hoping to, to obviously work on others. And this one is that, that curr uh, currently, uh, as released, T-boot and DRTM is specific to Intel processors. And um, AMD had never released a, a package for that for the AMD processors. Well, Safayet in our group has uh, redone T-boot to you know, uh, be support both uh, Intel and AMD processors. Um, I wish I could show you the demo because you can actually see P the, the DRTM PCR is actively on here um, because we actually have his version of T-Boot uh, running and, and, and providing the, the DRTM PCRs. Uh, while doing this, he also found a security uh, bug in, in the existing T-Boot uh, and, and we're working on uh, upstreaming um, all of those. It's going to be interesting to upstream the AMD support and T-Boot because T-Boot was originally an Intel supported package, so there might be some, but hopefully Monty can help us with. <laughs> um, 
So that's one gap that we've, that we've, that we've done. Uh, the proof of concept demonstration that I, I wish I could show, but I, I, I could do either you know, this screen or, or, um, or the demo, but not both for some reason. Um, but what I have on this is we have a controller, and, and the box has a, a TPM in it, a TPM 1.2. Uh, we have kernel and IMA. We actually have protected boot. I mean, this is the AMD uh, version um, with the SPI controls. Trusted boot. Actually, this, this is the, the Cyrix. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. This is this is Safayet's uh, uh, T boot, trusted boot. Uh, encrypted disk time to type tied to TPM with the TPM Lux. I'm a I'm a client running, and. Then I had running on the, so that was actually running in this box. And on the laptop, I actually had an IMA appraisal server and then a Predix client and Predix cloud to, to show what this would actually look like. And I have some screenshots, at least I can show. So uh, the concept is for all devices, um, all centralized in one cloud location, you could actually pull up an integrity report on, on every one of the controllers. And the idea is that, that this has, you know, for the management types, green is good. Uh, for us techie types, we can show that everything was signed, uh, everything had a valid signature, and all of the, the signatures are based on keys that we trust. And that the signature that the TPM did on the, on the PCR10 actually matched, so that we know that that's an untampered list. So this, is, this says, that, you know, everything looks good. And that's actually evaluating the integrity of 1,019 files that had been run. Um, and then actually, as part of the demo, actually log in uh, through the Ethernet. And of course, you know, these, don't, these don't run GUI front ends. These are embedded devices, so they just run a, a text-based console. Uh, but I logged in through uh, SSH and actually tried to run a program that was not signed. And even as root, you know, I'm not allowed to run it because it's not in policy to run for root to run it unless it's signed. And um, it actually stops it, and, but then what's reported through the IMA attestation is actually warning because the system's not been actually compromised. The file was not actually run, but the question is who's trying to run an unsigned file? You know, that's, that's a warning. But the measurement list does have integrity. Um, and, and the next level is actually I, I put in a uh, a kernel backdoor that could be triggered, so it's, you know, just a way of demonstrating uh, a kernel, some sort of kernel compromise easily triggered. And what it did then was go, went in and tried to sanitize the measurement list um, to remove any bad things. But of course, as soon as it tampers the measurement list, then the TPM quote doesn't validate. And so now we know something really bad has happened because if they're able to tamper the measurement list, then, then that's, the kernel has actually been compromised. So something simple for management, you know, green, yellow, red, uh, but all of the details uh, of all of the files and the uh, signatures on all of them actually reported. So kind of the bottom line on all of this is, you know, we are facing a nation state threat model uh, air gaps really only keep you from knowing that you've been compromised. Um, it's actually better to keep your communication open and do a, um, an attestation from the devices to a central model. Um, industrial control system security architecture, you know, at all levels, um, across all the pl different platforms and architectures, uh, protected, verified, and measured boot, not just one of the, or the other, but all of those. Trusted operating systems, all the necessary security services, um, cloud-based attestation and verification. And uh, obviously a lot of work still remaining to, to, to make this actually work. And with that, questions? How are you going to deal with NPM? Um, in what way? Uh, it's pervasive in the programming community to use NPM. You just go randomly download that, that little bit of software that you might need someday. Uh, well, and the, the whole programming model of, well, I'll just get it from the internet and uh, download it. I mean, uh, in our I case... Mean, I can see the intention, but how do you actually deal with it, deal with the reality of programmers who are completely out of control? 
So you know, I, I put I, I, so I, I, I put the yeah I, I understand. So I, I put the the four letter acronym acronym down there SDLC, um, which is it which is a, a big promise and and hard to deliver obviously. But um, we do at least have um, a lot better control since we are embedded since we do all of the 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 development ourselves. We control the inputs of all of them. We do have policies for that. I mean, they should be doing it. We also do have the various static analysis tools that, that uh, are in process to use to check uh, for a lot of reasons, not only security, but also licensing reasons. We don't want to get sued for copyright infringement and so forth. So there are a lot of things that look at source code from a lot of different perspectives that are, are in process. Is that a guarantee? No, of course not. Um, you can do, you know, um, some types of pen testing, you know, to look at the final result, but but it's mainly the SDLC, and 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 we do certainly have control over that internally, and we do take that seriously. Uh, do you have any um, communications with uh, the telco industry because they have some very similar uh, pieces going on? I don't think have we, Bill. Have we done anything with telco? Not. I don't think so. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do so in in. So as, as Mimi is saying, we, we know of certain gaps, and we know how to fill the gaps, and we're working on that. The um, interpreted executable, interpreted you know, uh, files, we actually can measure those at, at file open. We can do policies on them. Um, typically, in a general purpose computer, that's really hard to do because you get lots of things that are created on the fly that are not signed, and so you can't just blanketly you know, ban all of them. But on our controlled embedded environment, we'd actually get away with it. So we actually have static, statically configured uh, networking. We don't have to deal with uh, resolve.conf and, and other types of files that are changing that are you know, essentially impossible to sign. So um, it is a little bit easier for us to do that. Um, but, y but the interpreted files, whether you know Python scripts is if they're in a file, we do measure, we do sign them, we do va validate them. There are still gaps in terms of, of in-memory attacks. There are gaps in terms of uh, uh, executable data being injected across a communication link or you know across uh, that which we don't we don't measure. So there are definitely some gaps, um, and I think that's an uh, a challenging area of research to actually to try to close every single possible gap. Do you have any regulatory Well, I, I, I mentioned the ones that's the worst, the FAA certification. Um, obviously, they um, are very, very risk averse, you know, with aircraft systems, engines, engine controllers, avionics, and so forth. Uh, those regulatory things are really very strict and, and actually really pretty, pretty good. Um, there are standards that are evolving, IEC standards, 62443, and some others that are starting to come in. They're not really hard and fast requirements. They're guidelines, I guess, or something. Um, different industries might have different things, but um, uh, Bill, any other ones that FIPS, FIPS certification is also a big one. I mean, that's one of the issues with OpenSSL. It's not FIPS certified, and, and we have to do something about that. Thank you.